Good morning. So glad to see all of you here, here in person as well as those online. We're glad that all of you have joined us today to worship God and to praise our Lord and to sing praises and have a great time together. Uh, if you're visiting with us online, you can find our bulletins and church information on mumcnc.com. And we just encourage you to go there and find some church information as well as bulletin information. And I'm Reverend Tracy Shumpert, and we're so glad you're here. We begin our worship with the call to worship that's located in your bulletins. God's love for us is great. God is like a loving parent who watches over us. God's mercy for us is great. God reaches out to us in healing patience and peace. Praise be to God who has called us here. <clears throat> Praise be to God whose love and mercy is given to us. Amen. Amen. Our opening praise song is Your Grace is Enough. <coughs> Oh, 
next praise song is one that we picked, of course, with it being Father's Day. Good, good father. today to the good good father we come to offer our joys and those things that have been laying on our hearts this week those things that may be burdening us or those things we just want to share with God so we offer this time of silent prayer so that you can do some talking to God on your own and then we come back together for the pastoral prayer and then we have a father's day prayer so let us pray together God, our Father, we are thankful 
for all that you have given us within this last week and things we may not even recognize as your good gifts. Lord, we have those on our prayer list that we lift up to you, those that we have offered in silent prayer, those things that may be burdening our hearts that we ask for you to lift from us. Guide us and give us direction in all that we do. Give us your great and wonderful wisdom for all that we face. We are thankful for so much and so many ways that we can worship this day. That we can worship out here with the birds and with the sun and with the shade and with each other is a blessing. So Lord, we carry all that with us, especially on this Father's Day as we celebrate the father figures within the world, those who have impacted us, men who have lived a life of faith. And Lord, we thank you again for this time in which we can come to you, ask of you, praise you. Let us pray together this Father's Day prayer. Loving God, we lift this day our gratitude for the loving men you have brought us to the presence, to the precious hearts of your godly love. We give thanks to you this day for those who have shown us kindness, for those who have shown us courage, for those who have shown us generosity, for those who have shown us truth, for those who have shown us compassion, for those who have shown us faith, for those who have shown us love. Blessed be the name of all fathers, stepfathers, grandfathers, father figures, men who have offered faithful examples, all men who reveal a glimpse of your loving presence here on earth. May we now pray together the prayer that Jesus taught the Son of God, the Father, taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, Kimberly is going to offer our children's time. She also has snacks, if you... Need some refreshment while the sermon's going on? <laughs> Hello. Why don't you sit down in the grass with me? What's your name? Hi, Elizabeth on Kim. scripture this morning involves tea. Um, I'm going to tell, tell you all a little story about my own dad. And one summer day a long time ago, when I was a little girl at the beach. Okay? Well, my daddy was a big guy. Big. And as, as big as he was, he was actually also pretty graceful. He was, for example, a really good dancer, and he was a strong swimmer. He grew up on a farm in Pennsylvania that was surrounded by a crooked creek, and he would dive off the rock into the water on hot summer days just like this one. And my dad would just move the forward, backwards. Sometimes he would spread his arms out like a swan and then slice through the water without even a or if there was a diving board around, he would bounce high up in the air and do a special dive called the jackknife, bending in midair to touch his toes and then straightening out right before he hit the water. But at the beach, where we spent our summers on Long Island, mostly my dad just read books. 
Sometimes he'd bring a fishing pole in a bucket and he would fish in the surf, but mainly he sat in his beach chair just like this. And he would read and get sunburned. And because I wanted to be just like my dad, guess what I did? I read and I got sunburned. One day, while I had my nose stuck in a book, my dad jumped out of his chair like a shot. And he ran across the sand right through the water and he drove straight into the waves. I had never in my life seen him move so fast. And he came up out of the water and he started swimming arm over arm as fast as I had ever seen him swim. And suddenly it seemed like everybody on the beach was yelling. And there was my dad, way, way out in the water. And it looked like he was fighting with another man. They were wrestling in the water. And then it looked like my dad actually smacked him. And there was a woman standing on the water's edge. And she was screaming and waving her arms like crazy. And then my dad hooked the man under his arm. And he started to side stroke, swimming back to the shore, dragging the man along with him. And now the crowd was yelling really, really loud. <coughs> and I realized my dad wasn't fighting with the man. He was saving him from drowning. And I learned that day that people who are drowning, especially adults, instinctively clutch at anything that's near them to push themselves up and out of the water so they can breathe. And most often, that is actually the person who's trying to save them. And that's why my dad had to smack them to get his attention. Well, my dad pulled them both to where they could stand up in the water, and he slowly walked them up to the sand, right into the arms of the woman who had been screaming so loud. And it turned out she was the man's wife. And by this time, she was crying and thanking God. And my dad stood with the couple, and then the strangest thing happened. My dad took the man by the hand and led him back into the water. I thought, Daddy, what are you doing? That man almost drowned. But my dad walked him out into the water and stood with him, talking quietly away from the crowds for a long, long time. When my dad finally came back to his beach chair, I had so many questions. Dad, I asked, how did you know that man was in trouble? Why were you the only one who ran to help? And why did you take him back into the water after he almost just drowned? Well, he said, I heard the man yell for help, but there were so many people playing in the water that day, making lots of noise, they didn't realize he wasn't playing too, and he was actually in real trouble. And I saw his head go under the water, and I knew I had to act fast. When I reached the man, he was panicking, so I had to smack him hard to get his attention, or I might have accidentally drowned with him. Okay, I said, but why did you take him back in the water after all that? Well, my dad said, because if he didn't go right back in, he might have been afraid of the water for the rest of his life. He might never, ever go for another swim. Well, the lesson he taught me was that we can't allow fear to keep us from living a happy life and doing the things that we love. But also, that it's important to watch out for other people, even complete strangers, just like Jesus watches over all of us. It might seem like the drowning man was saved by my father. But if my dad was here this morning with us, he would surely say that it was the Holy Spirit that whispered in the wind that day and prompted him to look up from his book at just the right moment. He would tell me that Jesus is always watching out for all of us. He has been watching over all of you since the day you were born. He is watching over you this morning on this beautiful Father's Day out here under the tree. And he will continue to watch over you day and night all of your life. The truth is, I don't know what my dad actually said to the man while they were talking quietly in the water all those years ago. But knowing my father, he was probably saying a prayer of thanks. <laughs> he always told me that when life gets scary, we should go to Jesus and pray.
and God will give us the comfort we need to face any danger in front of us. So, will you pray with me? Thank you, God, for dads, for their wisdom and all they know how to do and all they do for us. And thank you for all the other people in our lives who look after us and care for us and keep us safe. Help us always to pay attention and to look out for others every day, even strangers who might need our help. And help us to have faith that Jesus is always with us to keep us afloat. Amen. Our scripture today comes from Mark, chapter 4, verses 35 through 41, and it's Jesus stilling the storm. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat. Just as he was, other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was dead calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? May God bless the reading of God's word. Well, Jesus and the disciples are in the same boat. And it's a night, a dangerous time for sea journeys and for papers in the wind. <laughs> and it's dark. And I've only been sailing once in my whole life. so, uh, And it was a calm day, so I don't know quite have this picture, but maybe you have been in a storm such as this. And Jesus invited them to go sailing right at this time. It seems like a good time, you know, storms, thunder, lightning. Let's go for a sail. <laughs> so they're traveling, and sure enough, a great gale arose, and the winds beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. It's dark, it's dangerous, they're alone in a boat with no one but Jesus to protect them. I don't know if you knew this, but the, the boat is actually one of the earliest and most constant symbols of the church. A boat with a cross on it for its mast graces the arch over the front of a divinity school that I once saw. And it's a very fitting image because Four times in this gospel, Jesus is in the boat with his disciples. We call the long central aisle, actually, in the church building, a nave, from the Latin meaning boat. The boat in the middle of a killer storm reminds us of that original boat, the ark, which braved the great flood and persevered for humanity and the animals two by two. Jesus' disciples cried out during this time, 
Teacher, don't you care that we're sinking? And Jesus wakes up. He's been in a sound sleep in a cushion because that's where you are in the middle of a storm. He's unconcerned and about the entire hubbub that's going on. And Jesus rebukes the wind. Quiet, be still. And the miraculous calm settles over the sea. And Jesus, having spoken to the sea, then speaks to his disciples on the boat. Why are you afraid? Don't you have faith? And Mark literally says in the Greek, they feared a great fear. I think it's kind of curious within the scripture, if you notice, at the very end of the storm, that the disciples are still fearing a great fear. Jesus doesn't say, as you might expect, why were you afraid? It's all over now. We're all good. He asks, why are you afraid? And this is after he stilled the storm, after he calmed the waves. Why are you even yet afraid? And then the disciples ask one another, who is this? that even the wind and the waves obey him. Who is this? That's the question on the table every time we get in the boat with Jesus. Who are these disciples who are still afraid even after Jesus performs this miracle? That's my question today. I think, personally, that there are at least two kinds of fear. There's the fear of the death-dealing storm. When you get a bad report after your physical, when you see the towers fall, the cloud, the pandemic, the great crash, a world-ending event, the park, church parking lot is empty, the waves and the wind. We cry out, Jesus, don't you care that we are perishing? This fear keeps us asking the question, why? Why did this happen? Why me, God? Why, why, why? That's a Good Friday kind of fear. And Jesus rises and rebukes the wind and the waves and it's calm. And that brings a second kind of fear, Easter fear. The main emotion after the first Easter wasn't joy, it was fear. Mark's gospel ends about a dozen chapters later, saying that the women come out to the cemetery and the angel announces, he is risen from the dead, go and tell. And the women don't tell anyone because they are afraid. Afraid of what? <laughs> Afraid that Easter might be true? And we say, who is this? Even death is not subject to him. It isn't over until he says it's over. He makes a way when there is no way. And it scares the wits out of us. This fear keeps us asking the question, how? How could we ever live the same way again? How does Jesus calm the storm and the storm inside of us? How can Jesus be the Messiah? The first fear, when we ask the question why, we may never ever get an answer to. The why about an event, the storm, the pandemic, the sadness, why things happen within the world, we may never ever get the answer why. But the second fear, we do have some insight and awareness to know that Jesus will help us with the how. Jesus who calms the storm, who rises from the dead, may scare us, but also assure us in the same breath. For if we look to Jesus and trust in God and look beyond our own fear, we rejoice in that calm. We can be thankful that Jesus will calm his children. In one of Will Willimon's um, first churches in rural Georgia, there was a woman he talked about that was afflicted with um, hypochondria. 
She was one of those people that if you said, you know, how are you doing? There would be a whole plethora of things that are going wrong. And he talked about that she enjoyed poor health. He said her whining, complaining, and belly aching, despite her relatively good health, were a burden for him and for all she came in contact with. She said one of the wiser members of the church said of her, if she actually got well, it would kill her. <laughs> There's something quite comforting about realizing that you've booked a passage on the Titanic. It's going down and it's taking you with it. Let the bronze strike up near my God to thee as we stoically resign ourselves to our fate. And some of us like to live in that first type of fear. We dwell there for years and days and months and a long time. And we feel comfortable there in that first fear. Wondering why, trying to figure it out, resign to the way it is. But then Jesus rises and rebukes those forces, forces which have no control and that demand that we sail on with him. So the question is, will we have and will we be able to live the Easter life? Will we be able to move on after the calm has come? Or will we stay in the wise? As we move through the pandemic and as we come to maybe the stilling of the storm, will we stay in Good Friday or will we move to Easter? And there's some scariness in that too, as we've talked about, of what Jesus can do when the storm is still. Are we able to move on? There is much more to do for Jesus and the disciples. If they do not get past this storm, and head into the calm waters, ready to face another day, then they are stuck in constant fear, and the disciples wouldn't have achieved any of the things that they achieved. If our fear makes us unmovable, then are we truly living a life of faith? Let us move through the storms of life, trusting in Jesus through the storm, after the storm and in the days that follow. When I was a kid, my dad would take me on roller coaster rides, and I loved them. I loved them with every fiber of my being. When those little tight things wouldn't say I was tall enough, I would beg the rider to let me ride. And my father was the only one that would have ridden the roller coaster with me. And so we'd ride on these holy roller coasters, and in the middle, my dad would go, boo, and I'd be like all scared, and I'd go, oh, it was so exciting. <laughs> a little fear in our lives is kind of fun, isn't it? The right kind of fear. The fear in what Jesus can do, the fear in what my father was trying to make fun on this ride. That our lives are not supposed to be fear-free. Because in the wonder of it all, we're going to have a little fear. Mystery causes fear. And that's why Jesus again and again comes to us and says, do not be afraid. Because we're constantly fearful. But as long as we're fearful, but we go ahead and go through it, then we have faith in Jesus who guides us along the way. May we trust in Jesus through the storms of our lives, in the calmness of what comes, and in the days to follow. In the name of Jesus, the Son, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We now affirm the faith that we claim maybe with a little fear and trepidation of what God brings to us, but let us affirm our faith at this time. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our cross today is filled with hats and mementos from those fathers we honor and are in remembrance of. And it reminds us how we are followers of Christ, but also how those in our father figures in our lives have touched our life of faith. Closing hymn appropriate for Father's Day Sunday is This Is My Father's World. I invite you to stand as you are able and sing with us, please. This is my Father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my Father's world. I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas, this and the Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit be with us in all the storms of life, calming our hearts and allowing us to know that even in the fear that God guides us. Amen. Amen. 